what we have here is our RPG uh, that we created earlier. We are manually animating it between frames 29 and 30. It appears in the frame. Really, we will see it for two frames only in our shot and it's going to be extremely motion blurred. And there is a little switch here that after frame 30 is going to disappear. And we're also trailing and computing velocity of it so that we can have motion blur from this geometry. That's it. So let's go. Let me just put my visibility flag here on nothing. So that next time if I jump inside this node, um, I don't need to compute anything. Let's press 2 and dive into our RPG test in LOPS. Here in LOPS, we are interested in LOP test 005. I'm putting visibility flag on our assigned material and let's check we have our RPG here uh, appearing on frame 1429. Right now we don't have any motion blur. So if we put the visibility flag on our karma and we check that our velocity blur is on, now you can see, well, we'll give it a second to compute. Now we'll see this blurred line because this RPG is moving tremendously fast. So what we, really, we will really see is just this blurred line. So everything is working. Now you're ready to start destroying things. Let's go to our area that is called effects and we'll start with our first pass with our effects heli RBD. Let's jump inside and see what we have here. This is our helicopter. You see we are bringing our out heli fractured animated helicopter. Let's double check, it's moving in space and it is animated. Let's look through the camera, move a little bit further, let's double check, yes, that's exactly what we want. Rotors are rotating, the helicopter is moving towards us. Then we are doing exactly the same things that we've done before. We are isolating the base for the top rotor and then we are isolating the uh, centroid for the back rotor, we will use them later for um, uh, our constraints. So I'm going to go really quick through the constraints here because we've already done all of them. It's just exactly the same constraints as you've seen before. So you already know how they're being set up. If you have not watched that video before, please go to the sections where we are talking about fracturing different parts of the helicopter. That's where we discuss these constraints in details. So first constraint we have is the helicopter uh, you can see is the rotator, the top part of the helicopter, connected with the front rotor base. And this is our one line. As before, we are connecting it uh, with one line, and then we're uh, changing the type of the constraint to be a single point. And here you, here you can see it visualized as a sphere in the viewport. After that, we are setting some uh, properties on this constraint, and this is going to be a hard constraint position only, which will allow the rotors to rotate. After that, we are creating constraints for the inside parts of the rotor, so all the fractured pieces are connected between each other. They are uh, connected as glue constraints, pretty strong, so that uh, these uh, rotor blades don't break off easily. Uh, after that, we are connecting the blades to the rotor itself, and the way it is connected is with uh, 4000 of uh, glue constraint. After that, let's connect our front rotor to the helicopter itself. You can see it's connected to the inside parts. And the glue constraint on it is pretty strong because we want to uh, keep this top part connected to the body of the helicopter. Because if you look again at our references, most of the time this two top part is stays together intact. The rotors keep rotating and this base is still connected to the body. After that, we are creating some glue and soft constraints, both, both on the tail pieces and on the front pieces. On the tail pieces, we are setting them as glue constraints first, but when broken, they switch to soft constraints. And for the body front, we are just uh, setting them as glue constraints. Here we go. That's a pretty weak glue because remember, we want pretty much the whole front part to explode and break into pieces. After that, we have our uh, wheels that are connected to the body. And they're connected with some pretty strong glue constraints. 
because upon explosion, we don't want those wheels to come off easily. The last one is the back rotor. And the workflow is very similar to the top rotor where we have this, uh, this part connected to the base. Then the constraint changed in this case to surface boundaries. You see two circles here. And after that, we turn it into a hard uh, constraint that allows rotation. And of course, we need to connect all the pieces of the rotor to each other and set some strength to these constraints. They're pretty, pretty strong. So most likely the rotor will stay as a whole throughout the shot. And then we have uh, this base connected to the helicopter itself. And we are setting the strength there as well. And the last one, before we cache everything, one of my favorite things, let's do our BD exploded view and see the fruits of our hard work. See how everything looks with all the constraints set up. Here you go. This is how our helicopter looks with all its constraints. It's a lot of work done here, but I think the result is worth it. But you might have noticed that this uh, exploded view computing all this chain took a while. That's why we are caching all of that, but we're caching it only for three frames because uh, our simulation will start at frame 1431 and we want the helicopter to enter the simulation. Maybe for one or two frames, we will uh, read the animation data, mostly for the rotators and for the forward motion of the helicopter. And after that, the simulation is going to take over. Though in reality, what we really need is just uh, three, four frames. And I'm giving it a little bit of a buffer before, just in case. You never know, maybe sometimes uh, the brief changes, the, the client looks at the shot and says, you know what, make the explosion one frame earlier, stuff like that. That's why I'm giving it a little bit of a buffer. So please cache this and let's take a look uh, what we do after everything is cached. The geometry is cached, now it's time to prepare it for the simulation. Let's unpack our cache. Let me zoom in so we can see our helicopter better and let's configure it. In this RBD configure, let me just scroll uh, up there and everything is black in the viewport. It's because our visualizer is set to active. Let me turn it off. So what we want to do is the same thing that we did before. We are animating our animated and active values. Our um, helicopter will be treated as animated for one frame after the simulation starts. Remember, our simulation will start with frame 1431. So first and second frame of the simulation, the helicopter will be animated. And after that, it will turn into active. Let's scroll down a little bit. And what we do here, this uh, RBD configure is for all the pieces and most, pretty much all the pieces of our helicopter are pretty small. So making sure that the collision padding is set to a very small value. We will double check our collision geometry later, but uh, when the solver creates a present, uh, representation of our proxies of our geometry, I'm making sure that the resolution is high enough. And then everything is set to metal, uh, chose copper here, but I'm increasing the density quite a bit because when I was doing different versions of the simulation, the helicopter, when it was falling, it felt a little bit too light. So uh, one of the ways to fix that was to increase the density. I also increased the friction and lowered the bounce so that when I have all the small pieces falling off the helicopter, they don't bounce too much on the ground. After that, uh, in the second tab, you see that we have front and rear rotor selected. And one thing that was changed here is the friction was changed to zero. Why? Because we want to allow the rotors to continue rotating. And then if we want, we have a manual control when we want them to start slowing down. I'll show you that later where you can control that in the solver. But by default, we lower the friction so that uh, really you have full control over it. And the last thing to configure one second, let's go turn off active again. The last thing to configure is our glass. There we change the um, uh, collision padding to something a little bit less because remember our glass panels are pretty thin. They're also curved. 
so want the collision padding to be even uh, lower uh, for more accurate collisions. And then I'm reducing user bounce and changing the type to glass so that those glass panels don't bound, uh, bounce off the ground. There you will see a little bit of a setup here, and I have a simplified version of it to explain to you what is going on. Let me just zoom in. I have a box, I have a simple box. Let me zoom out a little bit. And this box is animated over several frames. So if I go to frame 1280, you can see this box is rotated and animated in space just over three frames. Let's imagine I want to uh, run a simulation, but in the beginning, I want the simulation to inherit the motion of the box. So let me just connect this RBD configure proxy into my solver proxy, and let's look at this RBD configure. I am doing here exactly the same process that we discussed before. The box is treated as animated for two frames after the simulation starts and active is the opposite of it. But if I play, what happens, the box is just falling down. Because all the transformations happen before the RBD configure, Houdini does not see those transformations anymore. But there is a solution for that, and please tell me if you have a better solution. Maybe this is something I'm not noticing is the latest features, or there is some parameter that I'm not switching on. Mm. As you know, in Houdini, it's always 20 ways of doing exactly the same thing. If you have a more efficient solution, please share. Uh, but I will show you what I figured out. We will use the workflow of extracting centroid and transforming pieces so that our solver is aware of this initial box movement. So if I play now, you can see we have this initial bump and the rotation of the box. And how this is achieved is we take our box, unpack it first, then we freeze it on the first frame, and then we are doing extract centroid. So our centroid has the transformation and the rotation data in it. Then we are freezing this centroid. So we have here centroid animated, and here it's frozen on the first frame. And here we are bringing our initial frozen geometry. And we're using that in the transform pieces. So we take the frozen geometry, we take the frozen centroid, to grab the geometry, and then we have the animated centroid to be able to take this grabbed geometry and move it with saved data. So now when we do transform pieces, it should look exactly the same way. Let me template it as it looked before. No changes here. The only change is that internally Houdini is now aware of those transformations. And one last thing, very important, we have an attribute transfer where we take now our transform geometry and we copy the attribute of active and animated. That's very, very important. And let's play now and everything is working. Let me untemplate it. Let's play now. If I bypass this transfer of active and animated, what happens is it is just treated in the first frame as animated, and then this value continues and it never becomes active. So we want to transfer those values. So what is happening here on the left side is exactly the same process. You see exactly the same nodes. And we do that so that when we start our simulation with the helicopter, for the first two frames, we take into account the forward movement of the flying helicopter, it moves to the right, and we take into the account the rotation of the blades. So to keep this geometry, this is the process we do here. And you can see I have a switch here, which is connected to this RBD configure, to this animated parameter. So when we want to treat it animated, we do this whole thing. When we don't want to treat it animated, when it enters the simulation, it goes back to the first input because this calculation takes time and we need to perform it really only on the first two frames. After that, we do a little bit of a trail to compute the velocity of uh, our rotators and our forward moving uh, helicopter. Why? Because we will use this velocity and we will blend it with another velocity of an explosion to mix the two and to have both affecting the simulation. 